we're live. We're okay. recording, sorry. Uh, I will convene the uh, May 27th special meeting of the um, Weathersfield Town Council again for uh, budget deliberations. Uh, we are getting closer. Um, I don't know, you know, we do, we'll wait for some of the specifics with um, Mike O'Neill to come in. I don't, I'll open it up to the floor if, uh, I know Tom and I, Gary and Mike went through the numbers for two rounds today. Uh, first thing in the morning at uh, a little after eight and then again this afternoon. Um, we're trying to get to a point where uh, um, we feel comfortable where we're at. Um, I just want to hear from folks. I know a lot was discussed last night, and it was, you know, basically what was in the uh, questions that have been posed throughout not only the um, budget workshops with the department heads, but also through deliberations and through um, emailed questions over to uh, to Gary. Did anybody have any questions or follow up on what was discussed last night? Everybody's comfortable with, you know, not, I, I mean, not comfortable, I, they understand what was discussed and then, you know, they may or may not be comfortable with what um, was transpired. Um, I can tell you our our ultimate goal in all this process has been to continue with uh, services, um, no cuts, uh, you know, negative. So if we're starting off, you know, with 51 million as our budget, we're not going to go down to 50 million or 57 for the board of ed and bring them back down to um, um, 55. So obviously we've got the concerns of keeping services uh, the same for folks in town uh, as they have always expected, but with the reality that, um, you know, we're in a pandemic right now and uh, it's, it's tight. You know, a lot of people I know, you know, thank you, Pat, for going to uh, collect this afternoon. Uh, I don't know how many, you got a truckload and a, a carload of food for the uh, um, food Ooh. bank. Four? Four. Wow. So, and uh, obviously the food bank uh, and social services are very supportive of that, but you know, it, that's not enough right now is what we keep being told. Uh, and I've got another group of folks that are working hard to, to not only raise money, raise gift cards and um, non-perishable food for the town as well. Um, it's a, a, it's a constantly replenishing supply right now. Um, but uh, so we're looking at, you know, the, the hit that this is happening to, uh, to residents and the, the, their ability to pay right now. Uh, services are going to, you know, continue, they always have and uh, going to continue to, uh, um, you know, be there for the residents uh, when they need us. Uh, but the numbers are, uh, that we're working with, uh, increase the, the budget on both the Board of Ed side and on the uh, Council side. And, but we are looking for some ways to um, tighten our belt a little bit and be able to uh, um, comfortably say that we're continuing the services, but we're going to be able to do it for, uh, for less than what was proposed in the uh, proposed increases. Um, with that, I can, you know, turn some stuff over to Gary. Uh, I know you had a couple questions from Amy yesterday regarding, I believe, the library as well as um, the, the truck for uh, physical services. Yep, um, and maybe I see that Mike O'Neill is on, so um, I can do it quickly and we can circle back to it um, as part of the discussion of work that, um, that uh, we came up with. So on the library component, uh, what Brooke was able to do and come up with, um, I'm just kind of reading, she had sent me a letter as she was doing her analysis um, that if the, if, the, if the board was cut at any level, ultimately, 
Uh, the board has a final authority as to where any of the reductions will be made, similar to the Board of Ed conversation um, as to you know, what adjustments within the line item happen. Um, the director would base decisions off of what resulted in the least amount of impact to the public, as well as the least amount of impact to staff. In other words, it's that general maintenance of service uh, to the general public is, is very important. Um, so some of the examples that uh, Brooke Berry, who's the library director, had mentioned was purchase of fewer materials, both physical and electronic. Um, uh, there you would have an impact to wait times for the materials, fulfillment information um, to meet the educational and recreational needs of the residents. Um, collections may lapse in terms of their um, being recent or up to date. And um, there'll be a number of programming issues. Uh, obviously the dollar amount will make a difference. Uh, but less programming available to the community in general. Uh, hours of operation may be reduced or services on Sunday would be eliminated. Um, and then at a higher level also evening services. So ultimately just less access to the community as a whole. Um, she did agree that she would look at things such as furlough um, and um, reducing hours for non-union part-time staff which again turns into that's that conversation of reduced income for staff. And the majority of those staff that we're talking about are Weathersfield residents um, as this is multiple jobs for them. So there is that idea though, that, a, that a, a portion of those reductions could be offset by other funding sources within her organization, friends of the library, uh, donations, looking at investment income that might be available. Though I think we all have kind of concerns with touching investment income at this point. Uh, sorry, I'm just adding a couple of people here. Um, but any feedback or suggestions, there was nothing specific tied, I'm sorry, Councilor Bar uh, Morimbello, to the dollar amount. Um, a lot of that would have to be a, a reaction based off of what the reductions would be. Um, so I can- Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me, it's always good to know the impact on a program, so I appreciate that. Um, Mike, since you're here, do you, I, I was potentially going to go into the leasing conversation with the numbers that you pulled together, but do you want me to wait and just do that as part of the budget um, scenario conversation? No, you can do it anytime you like. Okay. So that one I will bring up. If I can find where it is. Here you are. So what Mike had done, everyone see that okay? Is that okay? Yeah, I can see it. So the categories um, of items that could potentially be le leased, the phone system, uh, what Mike did was run four police cruisers, which again was the request from the police chief, and then just for perspective, what it would cost for one versus the four, obviously there's a multiplier effect if you did more than one. Um, the transit fan request, the bucket truck, and the Jeep with plow. And these are based off of estimated rates that would be made available to us, uh, I'm assuming based off of current market. And so what you would see here is the cascade of payments for a five or three year lease, depending upon which, um, which item we're looking at. Phone system being the highest because it's the largest number. So this is also keeping in mind that we have a number of payments that are falling off next year. Um, obviously we wanna be careful with, it impacts our budget in the following year, although the per so the purchase wouldn't hit us this year, it would hit us going forward in next budget season. The budget truck, the budget, the bucket truck specifically, um, to kind of give you an idea of the analysis you're looking at, it's a $110,000 purchase, five year term at two and a quarter percent would result in about 
a little over 23 or 23.5 per year uh, for the next five years. The data that I was getting on the polls, well, um, I'm going this direction. There's 2,800 polls total throughout town. Uh, out of those 2,803, 2,300 plus or minus are the Cobra heads, those, those larger, um, more or newer polls. There's about 484, 485 that are older uh, and made out of wood. So they're about 30 plus years old. We are aware of several of them having issues, not able to, um, I don't want to give the impression that they're falling out of the sky tomorrow, but they're older and they start to rot and they need some level of replacement schedule. So if you think about a replacement schedule of, you know, trying to target those 40 or 50 per year is what they estimate we could do um, with staffing without overtaxing staffing. Um, if you consider that it's 40 or 50 per year, you would have them done within, um, turned over within 10 years. Uh, the general cost for our contractor to do the poll for labor plus the truck, not including the poll or the fixture, is $1,245. So every time we replace a poll, it's $1,245. If you multiply the 1245 by 40 or 50 poles, actually 40 poles, it's about $50,000 per year to do the poles. The truck's about 23,507 per year. So the next part of that was why can't we use the existing truck that we own? Yep, so the existing truck, Find my notes. To give you an idea of the type of use that the existing truck has, uh, if you look at the metrics from last year, there were a total of 67 trees within town that were removed using the truck, plus an additional 20 where truck and staff were used in Newington as part of the shared agreement, plus 195 work orders specifically using the truck and Corey's time. So added together, that's around 220, um, 220 active uses for that truck. If you think about that in terms of a full year, 365 days, a full work year, uh, in terms of days is around 260 days if you, if you take out weekends. That doesn't include vacation time or anything else. So um, if there's 260, work days in a year and you're using the pole, the truck for 220, uh, even if you did more than one a day, the availability of that truck is pretty much few and far between. And that 220 number doesn't include emergencies, accidents, storm work, um, hanging the lights on the trees, which came up. Uh, so if you included winter, again, with that 260 work days, right? So you got to assume during the winter, we're not probably using it as much. The truck's probably used 85 to 90% of the year um, for, uh, for tree-related for tree -related work. Um, you're also talking a smaller, more mobile truck, which allows you to get into different areas. And it also can be used as a work truck for the electrician and other staff. As Corey uses a bucket truck as his work vehicle. And the new and a bucket truck is needed to replace poles because our first discuss our earlier discussions were the purpose of the the bucket truck was to replace the light bulbs, but it's also needed to replace the poles. Correct. Is that accurate? Correct. And what's the cost for the contract to replace the light bulbs annually? So it's. Or how much did we pay this year to have light bulbs replaced? And I don't know if I have. Hold on. Well, Gary, while you're looking for that, can you also tell me how many times did Newington reciprocate on the shared agreement? Since we had 220 uses, and you said some of those were 
part of our share arrangement with Newington, I would assume they shared back with us, right? It's our, it's, it's a shared bucket truck with them. So we purchased it together. Wow. So we, and part of the right. deal, I like these deals, these, these deals that are in our favor. Uh, they were good negotiations. So they actually have to pay our staff when we go out to work on their um, tree issues. Okay. So the bucket truck, it does, it could be used to change light bulbs. It's just that it's, they're concerned that it's not available. It won't be, the availability is issue, not that it's <clears throat> not able to do it because of its size. Is that? I would say it's, I would say it's both. I mean, uh, availability is certainly an issue. It's not something we have just readily available, you know, to, to switch off, but generally you're looking at it's, is it a quarter of the size? How would I phrase that? It's a much smaller, more versatile truck. The tree truck is required to, uh, it's got a higher extension related to it, which means you're looking at stanchions, you know, a, a wider base to support it as it goes up higher. Um, so it's, you know, it's the difference size-wise between a, you know, a mid-size pickup and a large pickup or a smaller pickup and a large pickup. Um, you know, it's, it's a versatile use. I wish I, I'm just wondering if I have a picture of it that I can show you just to show the difference. Um, but it would be, it's less maneuverable. It's harder to get in different areas. The truck has more versatility to it. And frankly, capacity wise, again, if you figure 220 hits in a year, based off of how often it's used, you know, and if it's an emergency response component where you're, you're going out to one site, you could have need the truck on one side of town for trees and the other side of town for a light. Um, and, and I don't, I don't know if just for purposes of changing the light bulbs, not for setting the poles, would a simple ladder be, could, could that work or does it have to be like a bucket truck? Yeah, no, would, you would need, you would need the support of the truck. A ladder, if you think about the width of a pole and the width of a ladder, the general safety of, uh, of having someone climb a ladder without someone to, you know, you're looking at a, a multi-person team at that point versus an electrician with a powered bucket truck that can just go up, swap it out, bring it down. Oh, so the, it would be one a one person job, the electrician would drive the truck and do everything. I assumed that it would be in two people regardless, but. Depends upon the scenario related, right? So if you're, put, if you're putting a pole in, it's more than one. If you're going out to change a head, and um, I wouldn't, you know, try not to picture it as just a simple light bulb, they're relatively large. Although the LEDs are much more convenient and I'm, you know, but if you, if you look at a general telephone pole and how high up you are, um, could, could there be times where you need to? Yes, but for the most part, it's a one person job unless you're setting the pole. Gary? Yes, sir. Um, this is more just like kind of a CYA uh, question, but my brother's an electrician and I know that based on, you know, uh, you need different licenses to do different things because these are street lights. Does this, does this require any sort of linesman or anything or will just a simple electrician uh, or a simple E1 do it? I don't know the answer to that question. Our electrician can do it. Okay, thank you, Sally. Sally does. <laughs> he is like licensed. Said, like I said, CYA. Yeah, yep. absolutely. He is licensed to do this type of work. The type of voltage that is involved, it's not the higher voltage um, that, you know, it, it, it's, it does not involve, he would not be doing anything that's coming directly, you know, um, from the ground that yep. really high, that, that is an ever source. Um, type of work. Okay. And keeping in mind with that ever source is the one who's killing the power. Jump okay, in there, Mike. So, so we're saying that to lease the truck for five years, it would cost the town $23,500 a year for the next five years. Is that accurate? Yes. And then we're saying it could cost about $50,000 for pole replacement a year 
if we have a consultant do the work instead of doing it in-house. Is that right? If you replace 40 a year, it would cost us, correct, it would cost us 49800 the equivalent okay. of $1,245 per poll. And then the last thing is at, at a different budget meeting, I'm looking at my notes, uh, I wrote down that year to date, we've spent about $25,000 for the contractor to replace bulbs in 3000 for Eversource. So I realize the Eversource, either way, we're paying Eversource to come and turn off the bulb, the lights, the yeah. power. But so is my math right? 25000 for the contractor to replace the bulbs, 50000 to replace the poles. That's 75000 a year that we'll pay if we have somebody else to do it versus 23,500 for the next five years if we purchase the truck. Keeping in mind, we're paying um, our electrician to do the work. Is that accurate? Correct, yeah, based off oh. of those, if, if assumptions stayed consistent, in other words, you had that many people coming out. Mike, were you about to add something? Well, I'm just curious, what's the, the pole replacement cost is not something we're seeing presently, right? Yeah, so. What's the cost of the pole? What's the cost of a pole? pole a, is pole. a pole is $500, which was not included in the 1245. So the pole is about 500 bucks and the fixture is uh, 610, 600, 610, yeah. somewhere thereabouts. Yeah. So the 1245 is just labor and truck and the cost of labor in a truck. So you have to add the cost of the poles if you're gonna do 40 poles a year. Well, to a calculation, yes, but if we're just looking at the cost of the vehicle versus paying someone else to do it, I, I, to make it even, I took the pole out. Because that, we, didn't, we incur that cost regardless. So do we have, is there a place in the budget that is showing um, the $500 per pole times 40 poles that we hope to replace next year? I don't know if we no, took that in. I don't think we no. did. You know, I, 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 I broke. What's the, but what's the 40 poles? Is that? Well, Gary's right? saying, Gary I, was yeah. saying we have 400 wooden poles that we're hoping to replace over oh. the next 10 years. No, no, I, I was using, yeah, right. So I'll clarify. There's 484, 485 wooden poles that are we should target for replacement. You need to do at least 20 a year to break even. We're suggesting we have the capacity to do 40 poles a year, and that would be the recommended recommended replacement schedule um, to, in, to ensure we replace them along the way. We haven't included that cost within the budget, although we would have to absorb it one way or another if there was an accident, if there was a storm issue you know, someone hits the pole and takes it down, we have to absorb that somewhere in the next 12 months anyway. Okay, so even if we take, let's take the poles out because of this equation, because it doesn't seem like it's relevant if we don't have funds in the budget for, for the poles anyway. So basically we're saying year to date is about 25,000 to replace the poles with the contractor. This vehicle lease is 23,500 for the next five years. Are the, is that statement correct? So it would be less, in, it, it appears to be less to lease, to purchase by lease this vehicle than it is to pay the consultant to do the work. Is that accurate? And that's what I'm looking at it as a wash at, at, at the worst case scenario. And then after five years? We own the truck. The truck, okay. correct me if I'm wrong, Sally, the truck is like a 10 to 12 lifespan. Yes, uh, most of the vehicles like that, and the way that we caretake them, we could potentially get 13, 14, 15 years out of it, depending on the situations. Can we throw a plow on it? Can you throw a plow on it? Um, I don't know the answer to that question. I would doubt it. Question. <laughs> I would doubt that you would want to. Are there any towns that are looking for a utility truck this? that we can share with in our region? I don't know of any right now. Um, a lot of the neighboring towns that have gone into buying the uh, street lights are figuring out 
you know, different contracts. A lot of them went into it as we did thinking that we would have an outside vendor do this work. Uh, and then there are larger cities like New Haven, New London, Stamford, that before they even bought their lights, they hired staff and bought trucks because they knew from the beginning that they were going to be the ones doing the repair and replacement work. Gary, can I ask you a question? How many poles did we replace last year? Of the, uh, go ahead. Re we replaced so far this year of the wood poles. We've replaced, I believe it's um, it's eight, eight to nine, um, and then we replaced um, a few of the when they were doing the LED changeout. There were a few that were bad but it turned out to be less than 1% of what we installed in total. Um, so that's where we are to date on the poles. What we're finding with these wood poles, and if you travel around the south side of town especially, these poles are rotting. And so we've found that in weather, um, that's where they're starting to come down even more so than an accident, which Believe it or not, happens more than I thought it would. Um, so because um, that's, that's where. Yeah, so, but if we did eight, if we're at eight or nine now, I'm just trying to understand why are we talking about forty and using that number as a comparison? In order to be proactive to not have these fall, because the eight or nine that have fallen, um, in many of those cases, the fixture was also damaged. The fixture is a $610 part. And so we wanna be proactive. We know we have this deteriorating condition and we wanna go out and be able to replace the poles before they fall down. Therefore, we would be able to save the fixture, replace the pole with a fiberglass pole and get ahead of it before it falls and potentially hurts someone. No, and Even if you just focused on the eight, and looked at the 23,000 that you pay for the eight, you know, it's that question of where's that, re where's the return on investment? Is it, is it worth it for the purchase? And now you have the flexibility of doing more than eight as needed, right? So you can replace the eight that are fixed, save on the pole and grab two more while you're out there. All right. I, I, I understand, that. I guess what I'm just confused on is you know, why, if these poles are in such a state, why, why is it this year we decide to do something? And what did we do last year to address this or the year before? I mean, to me, these poles, they're rotting, didn't all decide to happen in the last six months. It was never addressed by Eversource when they owned the poles. Um, and it came to light even more so once we took over the ownership of the poles. When was that? Mike, aren't we in the first year? It was, this is the second year. Second year? We'll get in the second year. June 18th. I, I just think, is, you know, as we're looking at a budget and we're trying to find ways to be fiscally responsible, you know, I just, I, I, and maybe this is just for the sake of saying it, is I'm just blown away that, you know, now we decide this is the time to fix the polls when it seems like this should have been done years ago. For whatever that's worth. Can you jump in there for a second? Uh, how many how many times was a contractor called out to repair a light in the past year? So you what, have you what have type of light? Of, pardon me? What type of light? An LED street light. Um I would have to I don't have the exact number but it is somewhere around the same amount of times that we did the pole lights, the wood lights. So what, eight? Yeah. So 16, you needed to use the truck 16 times in the last year, is what you're saying. I, I don't want to speak out of turn, yes, we do have the figures, I don't have them in front of me, but it is around 16 to 20 times, yes. 
I think we should um, pursue, if, the, if, if you think this truck is so urgently needed, I do think that um, the fact that we do share a truck with Newington for the, the tree truck that seems to be doing well, and if we're not gonna be using the truck nearly as often as the tree truck is used, that perhaps, you know, the, uh, the town can look into an agreement to purchase a truck together with Newington or another town or even three towns. And, um, and it sounds like with the amount of use the truck, I mean, if, it, if the truck would have only been needed 16 days in the last fiscal year, I don't think it's an urgent need that we need in this budget. I suggest we put it off a year and in the meantime, maybe talk to some of the other towns and see if this is something that, um, you know, they could use or would like to go in on since it is a expensive truck. And, um, and it doesn't sound like it would be used so heavily that it couldn't be shared with another. I, I, well, just to clarify something, um, the purchase of the tree truck was a grant that is no longer available. Um, this truck would not solely be used for lights. That would be its primary responsibility. However, because of the fact that it is a smaller truck, it does have a grounded boom, we would be able to use it for other activities throughout town. Um, just just to clarify that it's not a sole source type of vehicle to be used only for lights. I just think it's important that we look at reducing costs and if we can, um, you know, find a way to do that and work with other towns, I think that, it, and not just in this area, but other areas, because I feel like we can't just go on and, you know, making these big purchases. I'm not saying that it's like a, a useless item, but I do think it's, with, given the cost, I, I think it would be worth pursuing, uh, sharing with other towns. Thanks. Yep, we'll look into it. Let me one other, one other comment, if I could. When the program was begun, according to what I read, the contractor, Higgins, I believe it was, um, they had all the poles inspected, wooden poles and all the other, the poles that Weathersfield was responsible for, 550 something poles that just had street lights on them. They were, they were inspected and Eversource was, was notified that a certain number of those poles had to be repaired or replaced. And I'm wondering if that ever got done. Seems to me if somebody inspected the pole a year and a half ago, they shouldn't be all rotted and falling apart at this point. I don't know if there's a way to go back and find out if we were either compensated for the faulty poles or if they actually went and replaced the poles. So that is a good question. I will absolutely follow up. I, I believe Power Secure did the inventory um, we'll check to see on the ones that did fall if, if those were included and whether or not we were compensated. Um, just to be clear or to clarify my points before is I think it was a look forward as to, um, you know, a consideration of a, of a replacement concept. That being said, you know, we, we can look at it in future years as well, but I think, um, you know, I think it makes sense to look to see if power secure what power secures inventory said and what it recommended. And then what we'll do is we'll come back, you know, next year or at a later date, if so decided it doesn't work next year based off of that information. So you can make a decision. I'm just thinking out loud that, you know, it's, there's a good possibility that all 485 wooden poles were not installed at the same time and are not at the same level of deterioration. So yep. With the with a the utility, they regularly go around and they check poles. I don't know how they do it. They check the moisture, the density, or something, and they they'll often select poles that look perfectly fine to you and I, but they're deemed uh, unsuitable. So I assume they did some kind of inspection like that at the time. So pa Power Secure 
like I said, I believe Power Secure did so, and they would give us a review. Um, if uh, again, just the clarifying the statement, I was picking a ten-year replacement schedule. No, I understand. Uh, so, um, but I no, I I will we'll take a look. Thanks. Yep. And, and so, did I do you correctly um, when Stanford and New Haven took over their uh, lighting contract over from either UI or Eversource? Um, they bought the truck prior to taking over or taking ownership of the, the poles or to, of the lights. I think that's what I heard Sally say. So, and I was. I don't, um, especially in Stanford, it was something the program grew. Um, by the time that I had spoken to the people down there three years ago, three, four years ago, they had already been involved in this for quite a while. And they found that um, in a lesson learned for them, they thought that they would start this program off um, without having to do much mm -hmm. uh, in order to support it. And then uh, they found as time went on that there was more work to be done. Um, and that's when they started to go out and hire their own staff and trucks so that as so that they did not have to go out and hire a vendor um, as both UI and Eversource, their inventory numbers and their descriptions of the polls weren't always accurate. Gotcha. Okay. So in New Haven. Yes. I was, I was city controller in New Haven when we- Coming from the guy who there. yeah, was sitting at the, the controller's desk at the time. Uh, Really Mike's fault, just going on record. <laughs> no. So, and we purchased these through a, the, the lights, uh, through a lease for about $300,000 a year. I, I'm trying to think 317. back. 2017, we purchased. 317. 317. Yeah, I think the final vote or the final you know purchase was done in, FY 18 and we're starting to pay right now one year. I wish I had known the situation. I mean, lessons learned from the city of Stanford. I wish I had known that prior to voting on the, the much touted savings that we would be getting through LED lights and owning them outright. Because now instead of paying $317,000 a year in lease payments to poles and lights, we could actually be paying close to 340,000 a year for these and not really recouping any savings. Um, just, just bear in mind that we're, we're seeing savings on electricity by virtue of the fact that we own the poles in excess of 300, it covers the lease payments. So when the lease payments end, we immediately recognize, you know, three hundred twenty thousand dollars utility savings. Huge, huge revenue yep. there. Yep. Yeah, it's, it, it, it was got, a good deal. Yeah. I think we no, said I, that. I think we said that when we made the purchase that it was. Right. It was we weren't going to see even. the savings for five to seven years. Right. right. Remember, we yeah. didn't we didn't budget the first lease payment, but it was covered by the the amount that the electricity went down. Right. Yep. And we will recoup those savings. So, but in the time that we're paying the lease payments on the, uh, the lights, you know, we're, we're breaking even. So, um, yeah, I wish we had known that we needed a $110,000 truck two, three years ago. Um, okay. Anybody else with any questions on, on that? Just a comment for the council, and it, it's not a. It seems to me that you know we're, we're drilling into the eight poles and the, the ten lights and the rest of it, and we have business people on this council. This seems like a very straight business decision. The return on the truck is three and a half years ish. That's a twenty five percent return. You can. We know that we're spending twenty five to thirty thousand dollars repairing this stuff, whether it's eight poles or ten poles or fifteen poles or the average of whatever, whether a a storm comes through, it doesn't come through in a given year, we work on sort of the best known averages. On a, on, on a three and a half year return, 
to, to pay this. That was the, the numbers that we got the first time and we bantered around some other numbers. So what you're doing is you're putting a council three, four years from now in order to pay this, this money that they've spent to these individuals and not gotten the return back. So, you know, anybody would, would ask for, for that kind of a return. And so now we're saying, hey, we're not gonna get this truck, but we're gonna continue to pay these, you know, labor and the rest of it for these people to come in. And they're take, it costs us a lot more because this is an independent company and they're trying to make a buck. So now they're gonna make a buck off of us because we didn't go internal. Um, in three, three, three and a half, four years, four, four and a quarter, whatever the number is, we're gonna, this is all gonna be great to us because now we don't have to pay these uh, in this company to come and, and do it. So, I mean, this is, just seems like a very direct, easy business decision. When we were talking about solar panels, we were talking about like eight, 10, 12, 15 year returns, which is a much different and difficult decision. But for a return like this, this is, uh, this is, this is actually a, an easy decision for us. That whether, and, and, and I think that Mary Pelletier is right because we get this truck now we have an asset that we don't necessarily need to use all the time, but we don't have the expense of the $25,000, $30,000 a year. And we can lease this out, rent this out, share with another community and derive more income, which would increase the return on the investment of the truck to begin with. So your three-year return on investment, if in six months you get together and say, East Harvard, you need another truck or Glastonbury, whatever, great idea, Mary, fantastic. Uh, you know, you get into an arrangement with them where they want to pay us $5,000 a year to borrow the truck every once in a while. Now your return on investment's going down to like two years, two and a half years, and then into, into perpetuity where the town of Weathersfield is able to recover, by, recover money by not spending it. This is just straight business decision. And, um, and while you can go in sort of the test case all you want, this is just money. And uh, from a budgetary standpoint, putting Weathersfield first, and in our best position moving into fiscal year 24, 25, and 26, you get the truck. Hey, uh, Matt, I hear what you're saying there. The question I would ask is, what is the annual maintenance cost on maintaining this truck? And who's going to do that? Seems like it's done at our garage and would, and would fall right in line with all the rest of the vehicles that we would go. But, but of course, Sal Sally's here, though. Right, there has to be a cost somehow associated with it. I'm sure the manufacturer told you what it's gonna cost on an annual basis. Well, so I can say this is a vehicle that will be purchased under warranty and we have mechanics on staff who are able to do the work for, so whatever is not covered, we have laborers in house and the warranty, the part would be covered. And then after that, it would just be parts. But Sally, I don't know if you have more to add or. Yeah, no, that, that's absolutely correct. It's very similar to how we maintain the, buck, the other bucket truck. We have the skilled staff in order to do it and the warranty work. We have the electricians as well, obviously. I, I know we have yes. one. We have the electrician on the town side. And again, that's also a very good point. This truck could be used on our school properties and we have a licensed electrician on, uh, on staff as part of the custodial union in the schools. Okay, sorry, Kevin. No, thank you. Um, Gary, Sally had mentioned, um, and I believe Sally, you said that there was eight replacements this year, whether it's for weather or car accident or what have you. Um, you had mentioned that um, the preservation of the light was you said it was about six hundred dollars to replace? Now, Gary, in your um, initial um, uh, number crunching, did you include a new light? Um, because if, if if one falls and we have to add on six hundred bucks to whatever we use eleven twelve hundred dollars, that obviously increases it by about fifty percent. Yeah. So in the scenarios that I gave, my focus was just on comparing apples to apples, in which case the cost for them to install it versus the cost for us to install it if we own the vehicle. So I just looked at the labor and vehicle cost, or rent, you know, cost of the vehicle. If it fell, if it falls and it shatters, we're paying for it anyway. If we, so that's right. So regardless of whether it's us or a contractor, if it falls and breaks, same thing, if the pole gets damaged, we're paying for the pole. So I broke out the 610 for the fixture and the 500 for the pole 
and just said, what's it cost for the labor in the vehicle? The labor is always is already ours. So it's just the I, I, Yeah, I see what you mean. I'm just trying to capture like what's the preventative number. I mean it's it's an imaginary number we'll never know, but um Yeah. I yeah, I mean if we preserving. were if we were to go on a on a let's call it risk management approach or um you know, we would be focusing on a replacement schedule. I would be pitching a replacement schedule of X per year, and that would be built. Um, you know, we already have a dollar amount built within the budget, but it would probably be larger if we're going to do 20. If you're just looking at addressing the eight to 10, we know that number is 25 grand. Um, now you just back out the cost of the contractor to do the work. You're just looking at materials. Um, and so you can you can stretch that twenty five thousand dollars further because you're spending one thousand two hundred and forty five dollars less per pole. Right, and that's what I'm that's what I'm trying to get at is that you know, if we could prevent eight to ten from breaking every year, it's preventing also the six hundred dollar loss of those eight to ten poles or lights. All right. Thank you, Mike. Yep. Sally, uh -huh. how 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 long does it take to replace a light? Do we have the cost on what it costs to replace a light? So I'm assuming if it takes an hour for an electrician and we pay an, an electrician 50 bucks an hour, have you factored that in? Because that obviously should be factored in as well. As well as some of the police well, forces costs. aren't free. So it, so I, I know I have that somewhere. I want to say it was 85 an hour, not including the truck. Um, nope. how, do you know how but, long it takes to change? But again, apples to apples, whether it's our guy doing it or their guy doing it, our rate is lower because we absorb the cost because we, the person is our hire. So even if their rate, which it w would be, if, you know, it's, they're ours, we already have them. It's not an additional expense. So whether it was a police officer that went out there for, um, for purposes of protection, um, usually for a light change, you wouldn't have that because it would just drop a couple cones and be up and down, just like cable. Um, those costs are already built into whether it's us or a or a contractor doing it. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions on this? Concerns? Okay. Why don't we continue on then, Gary? Good. Something definitely to think about. Mayor, could could I ask him to put the lease um, spreadsheet back up? I want to I want just want to take a screenshot of it so I have it. I mean, I can email it to you too. <laughs> that would be nice. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Which, um, speaking of that, how many, um, what do we have coming off of lease payments next year? Next fiscal year? I think I... 180,000. What was that, 180? Yes. 180,000. Okay. And that's budgeted, that's in our budget, Mike. We have that accounted for in our budget. Your, yeah. uh, the town manager's proposed budget. Uh, right, with the impact for next year or the benefit to next year. Right. Okay. So I'll just go back to that screen for a second just so you can see the others. So the, the, Again, other items that we moved from, so the lease payment uh, was always, I'm sorry, the phone system was always under the lease payment program, correct, Mike, in my original proposed budget? Yeah, for several, for I think three years now. For the last three years, right. And is that still in the budget as of right now? That's still a leased item in the budget? It's, there's no impact on the budget. It's noted on the CNEF schedule but it's not included in the general fund column. There's, there's, you're not making a decision on that project um, well, because there's no, it's, it's shown in the plan, but it's, it's shown as something that would be leased and therefore has no impact on this budget. 
Sure, but we would vote on it within this next fiscal year. We would vote to allow the purchase of it through lease payment. Okay. Um, so if we add up all of these, um, what's the total if you add across? Phone, uh, not, don't, don't add both cruisers though, because you have four and one. You know, if you just, if you did phone four cruisers and the other three items. That's 200,000. It's 200,000. We would be putting, we would be obligating into the following year as part of the lease program. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. At that point where you, you approved the purchase of any of those items and in conjunction with that lease financing. Okay. Thank you. So as and I'll, I'll, if it's helpful, I'll email this form to the council and you guys can kind of individually or as a caucus, however you want to do it, kind of look at the numbers and come up with different scenarios as appropriate or however you want to adjust it or consider it. Knowing that 180,000 is coming off next year. Just give myself a note. All right. Um, Mike, do you want to move to the teal? Let me see if I have. One second, please, for me to put this up. Mike, do you want to drive or you want me to? You go ahead. <laughs> let me make sure I have the right one. Hold on. Uh, I might have it up. You want, let me do it. I think I got, I got it right up. You there. have it up? I do. If not, I can. No, oh, I got it. Sorry, all. That one I'll need a little bigger, please. Yeah. <laughs> so what we've been working on um, in conversations with the mayor and the deputy mayor is um, an adjustment to scenarios with an ultimate goal um, to um, come up with a scenario that would essentially put us at no increase, and what that might look like. I thank Mike O'Neill for his patience with me and, uh, and strategy um, and trying to figure out how to do this with, um, with an understanding of we're trying to have the smallest impact to the residents in the general operations of government as a whole, while still maintaining commitments to long-term strategy um, and stability, sustainability of the community. Um, Mike, do you wanna do a walkthrough starting with tax collection, revenues to expenditure? Sure. Then we'll so, get to it. Go ahead. Um, two changes on the revenue side. One was uh, an upward adjustment of the collection rate from 98.65 to 98.95, um, coming off of the discussion and the information that was viewed last night on the, on the historical and kind of the, the low point over the last 10 or 11 years that we've seen um, on the actual 
uh, historical collection rate. So we bumped that up slightly. And then um, there were a number of deducts on the expenditure side. And we, to, to balance that off and to get to a zero mil increase. So there's, there's the, that's the mill rate for this scenario four that we're looking at, same as last year. And you can see that it brings, I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna scroll down and show you, we've used about $1.7 million of fund balance, leaving 10.44%. We were at roughly 11.5 or 11.8 um, prior to in the, in the town manager's budget. So that would, with that use of fund balance, would bring us down to um, slightly over the uh, the top end of the the policy range, the seven to ten. So the changes all occur in this column. You can see here we've added 1.3 million uh, to the use of fund balance. Town manager's budget had 400,000 for a total of 1.7 million. On the expenditure side, this is just expenditures by department. This column was the proposed budget, and those are the adjustments in, in this column uh, right here. Um, and there's just a series of those that we can you know, look at the detail on those um, on the following page. But again, those take us down, and it includes um, 973000 for the Board of Ed. Um, we add the $100,000 back uh, for the prescription rebate program, the savings that we took on this line in the proposed budget. Um, we put that back because that uh, appears not to be uh, in the near future um, something that we can do. So the total reductions, $575,000 on the town side, 973,000 on the, on the board side for total, total budget of 108 in this scenario. So we're, look, we're gonna look at the breakdown of that 1.549 uh, million on the next page. Is there any way we could get this um, email to us now so we can kind of go at it? At our own pace. Mike, I can forward it. You have it? Yep. Thank you. Oh, what's everybody looking at? You having a hard time seeing it, Kevin? Tiny in the tiny writing? Too slow, too slow. It's on its way. I'm gonna take that down for a second. I apologize. I'm, I can't see it. So I'm gonna bring it back. There we go. Sorry. So what you'll be getting is just that these are all the detail items. And then the, the table at the bottom is just summary by department, which is what you see on the, on the previous, the colored spreadsheet in each of those adjustment, in the adjustment column, you see all those items. So is it my understanding these, this is the result of the meetings that happened today? And this was the request from leadership of the council to make these adjustments. Not specifically, oh. not specifically those. There was a converse, There were some. There were some recommendations that we came to what a number was, and then I went back through to see what we could do based off of collective bargaining agreements and what in conversation with staff as to what they could do. 
So the town council leadership talked to you and said, hey, we're really trying to get to about here. And then you were presenting this scenario to us as a way in which to get there. Is that fair? Yeah. Okay. And um, the number that that you were asked to shoot for, just so, we're, so I understand, I know that there's been some adjustments on the, um, you know, on the, uh, not the mill rate, the um, collection rate. What was, what was that number that you were asked to shoot for? It wasn't a dollar amount in specific, but uh, the idea was to come up with a scenario that had the least impact to operations and kept us in, as far away from any increase as possible. Increase in taxes or increase in spending? Those are two different things, actually. Uh, I'll say in increase in, in mill rate. Increase in the mill rate. Okay, that's the third. Yeah, okay. trying to keep the mill, trying to keep the mill rate at where it's at, and still maintain as many services and functionalities and functionality as possible. As much. And what was what was under this scenario? What is the increase in the mill rate, or is there any? There is none. So under this scenario. The mill rate is completely even by doing the various procedures that we're looking at here. Correct. Okay. And do you think as the town manager that this does, I know it certainly has other effects financially on the, on the soundness of the town, but do you think that this reduces any of the services or capital that the town has? A major impact will be the pools in terms of services. Um, camps are already closed, so we had to make adjustments, obviously, for impact of staffing related to that. Um, and pools are still up in the air um, in terms of whether or not we're going to be allowed to. My personal opinion is that Willard is probably not a safe one to open. Mill Woods is still that question mark. But uh, before I had this meeting, I was on a call with the governor and they're still holding firm with, um, you know, guidance that it will be able to open, um, but then they're pushing off to a later date as to when to confirm what the guidance might be. So staff has worked out a scenario where we could open Mill Woods, but at the same time, you know, there's a dollar amount associated with that and there's some, you know, there. to answer your question, that would be the probably what I see is the biggest impact. There is an impact to staffing in the physical services department um, in terms of a vacant, uh, an existing vacancy. That saves us about 75,000. Um, there would be, there would be some impact related to, um, to productivity on that level, but it is a vacant position. So we would have to absorb, figure out how to absorb that in house. But so there were there were vacancies that you were going to fill. Now you're not filling them, so the staff will be reduced. Will yeah, be reduced. Is that there'll accurate? Be a, there'll, there'll be an impact to um, productivity. Not productivity. There'll be an impact to turn times on things, but it'll be minimal and be able to be absorbed uh, more so than if you think about the other scenarios that I put up. Um, there is an impact to staffing. There is an impact to workload, but it also allows for existing staff to remain whole. So how many staff positions will we be losing under this scenario? If the vac one with the vacancy, and then mm -hmm. if pools remain closed, you'd have to give me a second to look because they're mostly, they're full-time equivalents. They're not full-time positions. So it's, see it's some seasonal positions and some, uh, and some, well, they're, they're all seasonal positions. Some are pool focused, some are fit, um, located within parks and recreation, lifeguards. Um, How about full-time staff? I understand yeah, that full, the seasonals, if you don't open a pool, you're not gonna have the lifeguards. That makes sense. Correct, so full, full-time full staff. Full-time staff, base, you know, core, core of the town. Yeah, is, vague, is, one, is, the, is the defunding of one full-time position. So we wouldn't eliminate it from the budget, it just wouldn't be funded this year but you're not gonna have the position, right? If it's eliminated from the budget. 
I won't have a body in that in that I won't be able to put a, a person in that position. Okay. So is there one? I see I see a mechanic at a bare minimum. I'm seeing this for the first time. Are there any others? That is the only full time position. Okay. That is being very Yep. How long has that position been vacant? Uh I would say I don't know if Sally's still on the line, six months. A little little less than that, but it has been a few months um, finding um, pre-COVID, we had started doing interviews uh, for the position. And then once COVID hit, we hit the pause button on everything. Now, um, I certainly understand that, you know, the leadership has brought forth this type of thing. And Mike or Mayor, I'm going to just sort of speak directly to you as the head of the council. Um, I don't know if there's a discussion for negotiation, maybe something that you want to sort of take offline as far as sort of a, a, a ease of back and forth. But um, that's going to be, you know, your leadership decision, of course. And, and as the mayor, that's your prerogative. I'm certain uh, that uh, part of the Democrats, minority, but we're really, we're all in the council. I'm interested in working with you to, uh, you know, hopefully agree on, on a lot of things, ideas that you guys are putting forth. Um, if you are interested in any of our ideas, uh, let me know. And I'm interested to see if you're willing to discuss, um, you know, some type of a compromise position or a consensus build uh, on the council. And that's your decision, of course. Matt, I am always open to suggestions. I've asked it uh, a number of times if, if you guys on your side wanted to reach out with uh, ideas, you know, by all means. Um, we have heard from folks, um, some pretty loud and clear, that uh, they were not comfortable with six years or so, with the exception of last year due to uh, reval. Um, that uh, you know, ever increasing mill rates are, are putting a strain on working families in town. Obviously, COVID is putting a strain on working families in town. <clears throat> Our goal has always been to to try and keep the mill rate at forty seventy four, if not lower. Um, yeah, I mean there there are going to be some sacrifices, like a, a a position or two, until we can get out of this situation financial situation um you know as i like to you know refer back to you know we do have um you know obligations to the town that we are, are going to continue to do um you know, I, I, in conversations with folks I, I feel comfortable that uh um, the work that could be done with that vacant mechanic position at physical services can be absorbed by you know the staff that we have um that um you know it's just like the police department I, I believe there's four maybe five uh open police positions you know we're looking to hire those but uh you know god willing our, our, you know, we have great town staff that can step up and and work uh, a little extra work harder so that they can uh, uh, continue to maintain the uh, the services that they provide to the town but obviously to, to back to what you, you suggested, if you're offering uh, some places, please, by all means, you know, give me a call. I know you and I talked offline before. Um, take a look, you, you've got the budget, you've got the department uh, presentations, uh, just like the uh, eight of us. If there are places where you can see that we haven't listed on here, uh, that we could look for savings, without an impact on services um we'll listen that's for sure you know I'll drop whatever i'm doing and, and get on with mike and gary to make sure it works so um i do appreciate that uh that offer the um just i'm just looking i apologize i think it says mechanic on there i think we it was supposed to be switched to maintainer Yes, we, that's what I was just about ready to text you. We, that we, was the same position 
we talked about earlier today. I think it was a maintainer one. Yeah, I'm just trying to look at both my notes and that, and I think that was, but that's, I think ultimately it's the, it's the dollar amount that we're concerned about more so than the position we can work out the, we can work mm -hmm. out those details. If, if I recall, Gary, you, uh, we had the mechanic at 85,000 and you thought a better move would be to go with the maintainer at 75,000. Correct. Um, you wanted to preserve the uh, position, I guess, or the funding for the mechanic? Or yep. Yeah. <clears throat> so I'm open to, you know, anybody else? Sorry, Gary. There, yeah, I apologize. There, there's just a couple of, um, just for the council's uh, benefit, the, the, the dollar amounts are correct, but some of the language in the description needs to be adjusted. Um, and I apologize for that, the mechanic being one of them. <laughs> I'll make sure to clarify and get it out. The dollar amount is essentially the number uh, that we need to look at. It's just some of the descriptions need to needed to be cleaned up. And that's just a matter of short window time frame. I focused on the dollar amount, and not on the, the language. I have a quick question about the um, prescription managed benefit. Um, this was, I know we discussed this a little bit in one of the budget workshops. This is the, um, was it the teachers union that said they needed a 90 day notice before they, um, considered any changes is that is is that right my there's Gary yeah there's 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 language when every contract has a diff, has different language in terms of notification I believe the the teachers union requires notification of 90 days that doesn't necessarily mean they have they, they can't respond sooner but their language I believe reads that they they're required to get a 90 day notice on any changes okay so they haven't made so is it still going to be pursued once that 90 days is up or is, is there a window that is closed on that or is it still possible that we'll see some savings there or um you know are they going to be considering it at the end of that 90 days or is it is that ship sailed i mean i i have no issues if the if the board of ed wants to you know encourage them to come back to the table to have the conversation i i would never take a savings opportunity off the table um obviously we have a window in which we can realize well actually we can always realize the savings but there's a window of opportunity right the the sooner we do it the sooner we realize the savings let's put it that way okay. Thanks. Kevin. Thanks, Mike. Um, and thank you for, for putting this together. I, do, I really do appreciate it. Um, first, I just kind of want to start, and we had our, I just kind of want to remind everybody, I'm going back to my notes on the public hearing. Um, and I'm not obviously immune to the global pandemic and the, uh, what it's caused to our town, but we did have 50, six people contact us, 44 were in support of the town manager's budget, 11 were against, and one wanted, one wanted both. So we did have 80% of the people who did contact us were in support uh, of the town manager's budget. I just, so I just so we're, we're clear that, you know, I know we're all hearing from different audiences, but at the same time, those are the people that spoke directly to us. Um, and moving on to the budget itself, um, Gary, yesterday, I believe Councilor Flanagan asked you about the pools and regarding CCHD's recommendation. I, th I thought we were told that we were awaiting guidance and that the CCHD, I mean, what, what happened between last night and today? 
or now they're recommending its closure? No, I, I think I said of, uh, maybe 20, 10 minutes ago or so, we're still awaiting guidance on there. CCH, CCHD is, uh, the guidance is Department of Public Health. The guidance comes from the state. CCHD yeah. is a recommendation. So, but so if it's removed from the budget and then so tomorrow they say, you're all good, um, where, where do we recoup? And we want to open the, how do we open these pools if we don't have funding for it? Right. Uh, if, if it's not approved in the budget, you don't. Um, what I can try to do, I just didn't have time to today, is I can try to look to see if there's alternatives of other places where you can go to cut to, well, to swap that out. Uh, my, my comment to that would be it would be um, Willard is harder to open than Mill Woods. So a consideration has to be, is it one or two? Um, and yeah. which, which one would it be? Again, that's a council level decision, but just from my perspective, from a um, health and safety standpoint, uh, I, which one I can to I totally agree um, it has to be safe, but I mean, we also have to remember that it had almost 30,000 visits last year. This is where our kids go. I mean, that was only for two and a half months that it's open. Um, our kids have been, they've been cooped up since February. <laughs> This is room I know other towns are looking at, but I just feel as though that if we get the green, I feel we're preemptively take. This isn't a, a safety thing right now. This is a cost saving measure. I think we have to be honest about that um, because we haven't gotten any guidance yet. We're just unilaterally removing it from the budget, and now you know these you know students. You know that's what four hundred kids a day go to these pools in the summer. And now we're taking that away from them after they've been cooped up in their house since February. I find that, I mean, that's, you know, we, we've all, a lot of us grew up in town. We've all had experience, probably the first time ever these have been closed. I know we've never gone through this before, but again, this isn't a public safety thing. This is a budgetary thing. And regarding the collection well, I, rate. Let me just jump in on the, the safety. I mean, I have, I'm hopeful to get on a, call with Kerma, our insurance company, next week to talk about liability for municipalities or anybody that, uh, you know, opens to the public um, in places where they can't, you know, properly social distance. And one of the things that has always come up with, you know, both liability and for safety has been the ability for, um, families, you know, young kids to be able to properly enjoy the, the recreation and be able to ensure the safety of those that they interact with. And talking with other towns that have closed their pools already, it was a decision that they made not based on budget, but based on safety. Um, also, with regard to um, the pools being, you know, 400 kids a day. Actually, when I heard that, I kind of, my heart skipped a beat thinking about 400 kids a day um, going through the gates. But also, if we did June 20th, and I don't know if Kathy is on the phone, but maybe Sally could answer or even Gary could answer. Typically, the pools close right around August 15th, somewhere around there, mid-August, so, the dog yeah. swim. So here, here's where it gets funky, but yes. Yeah. So we're typically end of June, and we're typically August 15th. There was $2,000 originally put in the budget to go to the 21st of August. Um, a lot of visits depend, always depend upon when school starts, when school begins, not only for in Weathersfield, but also the college students who are um, who are uh, the lifeguards. So, you know, June 20th approval might be a July 1 start for us. Um, uh, I think that, and I'm not sure if the number is 400. I know I had provided, you know, 15,000 for one and 13 for that. But the idea would be that spaced out over a period of time um, and part of 
Kathy's game plan, I believe one of the strategies was to open instead of one o'clock, they'd open at 10. So you could have more people throughout the day, fewer people at a time, but more people, same amount of people throughout the day on a rotation. Um, so we're, we're looking at every strategy to give the council every option to make the, a comfortable decision. Yeah, I appreciate that, but, but regarding Kerma, I mean, that's, again, I thank you, that, that is very helpful, but at the same time, that's next week, we're, we're making this decision to close it now. Um, so we can't, we can't talk about safety when we're still awaiting guidance from the other. This is, this is, this is a, a budgetary decision. So, I mean, and, and, that, and that's fine. Um, but, but also in town, we have, we have a private pool that will open this year. And, you know, we're basically, we have the haves versus the have nots. Um, and that's, that's just the way it is. And it, to me, it just, you know, with this is, we're not talking about a million dollars here. Um, and this is something that's been a part of the fabric of our town for forever. Um, and removing that unilaterally as a budget decision, I, I, don't, I don't think that's the right move. You could always, fund it and if they say sorry guys you can't do it this year there's no way we could do it you put it in a non-lapsing account we have it for next year and we know next year is going to be bad anyway i mean there, there's ways to get around like you know we just have to give ourselves some flexibility i know we're running out of time here but at the same time <clears throat> and this is it seems it seems trailer we're you know we're arguing about a pool here but you know we need to provide some normalcy to to some parents and some, and some kids around here well, yeah, and <clears throat> those are all things we're considering. I mean, it, like I said to, to Matt, Kevin, you know, please, you, you know, at least from our side and from the side that, uh, you know, raised their voices for the last six or seven years, you know where we're, we're headed. You know, if I've, I'm staring right down a, you know, 40.74 mil rate if we can if we can get there and maintain the pools add a bucket truck add a maintainer uh I, I, i'm with you i i, I trust I, me you're I, not none of us now, but at the same time it's what 200 grand to open these pools is that Gary? Point one of a mil no no one's gonna no one's gonna fight about 0.1 of mil to open to open the pools to you know to provide some normalcy to some kids lives and some parents lives in town and also like, not to have that division between kids who go to pine acres and kids who go to mill woods right i um, i got it's um uh i just want to bring the, the collection rate i, I see we, we talked about moving that up um, you know, we've been talking for weeks and weeks and weeks about how the you know, employment rate and how we don't know who's going to pay in time. If that's the case, why are we moving the collection rate up? That just seems very risky to me. I can, I can comment on that if you'd like. So we moved it up a very slight amount. It's still in line with the lowest of the rates that we've had in the past 12 years. Uh, the number that was in last year's budget, uh, 98.65, was almost an arbitrary number that we not, we're not really sure how that came about. It's not based on any historical number that I'm aware of. Yeah, and I mean, it, uh, Mike O'Neill had mentioned it was, it, was, it was an arbitrary number, but my issue is do we expect more people to pay their taxes this year or fewer? I would say the same amount. If you, if you look at actual collection rates, they're 99 and a half. So we're, we're well above that. But th those are, they're, those are historical numbers and we're at a, we're, we're not exactly at this. We're at a historical, uh, you know, we, you guys have been talking about an unemployment rate at 20 and 25 percent. Now you think more people are going to be paying their taxes. We also looked at the, some of the worst years, 2008, 2009. And uh, they, were, they were not low. Those numbers were not low. And some of the conversations we've had, people are 
like I said last night, people are planning on paying taxes. They have an obligation to the town. They actually appreciate the fact that uh, they have until the end of October to be able to pay them uh, with minimal penalties included in that. Uh, a number of most, not, I can't remember the percentage, but the majority of residential property owners pay through an escrow on their mortgages. Uh, I've heard from seniors who are still able to pay. And for those, you know, that have unfortunately fallen on hard times because of COVID, you know, there is, there are mechanisms in place um, for us to, uh, to recoup their taxes three months later. So, so, and I know a lot of times we use the rate, um, that number as almost like a contingency, but which is, which is fine for budgetary reasons. I mean, it's not like we can print more money, but then if you look at the contingency line item on page, whatever this is, adoption scenario for page two, we have no, does that mean we have no contingency for, for this? No, no change to the contingency. No change. So we still have three, 340? 340, yes. Okay. And what is the, back to the uh, collection rate, what is the, what number can we attach the two in either in terms of a dollar amount or a mill about, rate moving from 98 to 207,000? 270? Is that, is that close, Mike? He's calculating. I'm not calculating. I won't give a distinct answer until I do, but you're, you're in the ballpark. You're in the ballpark. About two, 270 is something what we're talking about. It's not a significant change on, uh, on the 90, levy. $92 million. Well, I, yeah. See, I mean, I, I realize how that's not a significant change, but opening two pools, it's the same amount of money, and that's somehow significant. You see what I so mean? It's, if I could... Uh, I wanted to just make a little comment about the safety issue of the pools. And we did in fact talk with uh, Charles Brown, the health district person. You know, we pay the health district 185,000 a year for their advice and providing health programs for our town. And he is, he is adamant about not opening the pools. And it's one opinion, obviously it's not, it's not the only opinion, but if you recall back in the end of March or early April when this whole pandemic came about, um, he, we invited him to the town council to present to us what, what did we think was gonna happen with this COVID-19 and what could we do to prepare for it? And uh, you know, it was a good talk, but the point I'm trying to make is we asked for his advice then and now it's like we don't want to listen to his advice because it doesn't fit the narrative of opening the pools. And I'm sorry, but I don't, don't believe it's a financial decision. It's a well, safe. No, I, get, I guess what I'm saying, Tom, is just that for the past three weeks, we've been talking about a way office. Now we're just making that decision without what, what, what changed. Uh, I'm sorry, Kevin, we are breaking up. Could you say that again? I'm sorry. The, uh, I'm just saying that we, you know, for the past three or four weeks, we've been going through this process. We've been talking about waiting for guidance from the governor's office, and now we're no longer waiting. We're just making the decision. Like, what, what, what happened? Well, I mean, I can chime in. We were, we were having those discussions from the get-go, uh, Kevin. So maybe not as a whole here, but they, there were discussions that were being made prior to that. I think Friday's closure of youth camps uh, weighed heavily on at least my decision um, for this. Uh, again, you know, I'm right there with you. If you're a working parent and you are now being asked to go back to work because you are a phase one or a phase two employee, you do not have reasonable childcare provided now by the Parks and Rec. 
I mean, that, that's what youth camps are. And, and the sole reason why they were canceled is because the, the close proximity of kids together was the, the, this that drove the governor to make that decision. You know, right now, schools are in phase two, uh, but the more I hear and the more we see of other towns right now, prior to any decision, it, it's, they're closing it for the safety of the kids. Uh, so, you know, I guess everything that you're seeing on this table you could say is new to all of us, but you know, a lot of this had been discussed, including, you know, the, the G, the, obviously the, the bucket truck had been discussed in the past. Um, you know, we're, we're looking at places where we can continue to provide services. And uh, these are discussions that were made, not just simply today, but discussions that have been had by folks for the past couple of weeks. I just want to chime in and agree that I that to say that this is not a safety issue and that this is solely just a budgetary decision and that safety has nothing to do with it is kind of ridiculous. I, we all know that we would not even be considering closing the pools if it wasn't a safety issue. And I so and, and I bring my kids to the pools. I and I I, I saw I, we also those pictures of the Ozarks over the weekend, of the people all together in the pools in the Ozarks, and I thought to myself, that's what Willard Pool looks like on a really hot day, which is, I mean, so to say that oh we're just you know, this isn't a safety issue, you know, is to seems like a very cavalier. I think we're. We shut down the schools because of COVID-19. We closed the library for months because of COVID-19. We, you know, closed the community center because of COVID-19. We shut down the economy because of COVID-19. And to say, oh, this has nothing to do with that. This is just a budgetary decision. I just, I just have to strongly disagree with. It's all about safety. And while the decision hasn't come down yet, from everything we've been hearing, um, you know. I, I don't think we're going to be able to open. I mean, even the town manager has said Willard would be extremely difficult. I think we all know what that means. As of a week ago, we were, you know, I was thinking about signing my kids up for summer camp. And then on Friday, you know, there it goes. It's gone. So I don't, I, we'd have to make a decision if we're going to have it in the budget or not. It's budget season. But the decision is made for safety reasons, not because of just budgetary concerns. I appreciate that, but I, I, the, pri the private pools in town will open. Um, they're awaiting guidance just like we were. Why we can't fund Mill Woods, which we've talked about, um, you, could, you can fund that if it doesn't open, you put that savings in a non-lapsing account, we have it for next year. You, I mean, just to, just to we're unilaterally making this decision when we are not public health experts. We are awaiting guidance, but now we're saying we're no longer waiting. We're making this decision. No one here is a public health expert. You know, no one is, we've been talking about waiting for the governor's office and waiting for the state to give us guidance. But what, I don't, I don't understand why we still can't wait uh, to put it in there. And then it's, it's not, this isn't a, a million dollars. You know, I, it's, it's, I know it may seem trivial to some of you to fall on a sword like this for something like a pool, but it's like, I mean, we, we have to provide some normalcy to, to, to parents and to kids' lives. We're not health experts, but we consulted the head of our public health department, and this is his, his opinion. So this isn't something that we're deciding as health experts. I mean, we, the, the governor and the, public, the state public health department, they, they're not giving us anything. But we went to our director of public health for the Central Connecticut Health District, and that's his opinion as a public health expert. But I agree with you. I, I, it, it, about Mill Woods, you know, I think, is there a chance? I don't know. I don't want, it seems like one of those things that we would 
budget for and then they're going to say we can't do it anyways that's how i feel but no i i mean it is it is a blow it is a blow and i in this we wouldn't obviously never consider doing this if if it weren't for this terrible virus that's taken so much from us can i ask a question to gary or anyone else in the know um cchd is is us rocky hill berlin and newington if i remember correctly do we know what the other member towns have done or plan on doing regarding their town schools? Newington has pushed the button on a bunch of things and closed it very quickly. Um, well before even camps were overly decided other places. I cannot remember Berlin. I believe they have closed. Um, I can check in a few minutes after I answer Rocky Hill. Um, we're in contact with Rocky Hill on a regular basis and we're both kind of holding out to try to wait on the guidance. Um, I was on a conference call before this meeting started. I had to end it for this meeting. Uh, that question came up a number of times. Uh, the governor uh, as well as uh, DECD and DPH both pointed to a June 20th date. Um, but again, my concern continues to be June 20th is the date right now. Does that change? Um, Rocky Hill and Weathersfield again, Kathy, you know, Kathy Bagley, 30 plus years experience um, with and relatively creative with how to make things work has been working with staff on a contingency plan. So if we could open, um, we will open, we would have a way to open um, at the same time. Um, timing is kind of everything when it when it comes to this, and they keep pointing to this June twentieth date. But we have a budget we have to figure out, so it's a it's not an easy decision for council. Um, my only commitment would be that if it goes the way of opening, we will have a contingency plan on how to open safely um, for Mill Woods um, because we can't figure out a way to do it with Willard as safely. Um, but I don't, I, you know, I think the risk is whether or not, you know, you have two levels, should we, and will we be able to, um, both of those are up in the air. Gary, is there a scenario that allows us to open if we're able to under this, I guess, under in, terms the budget of in terms of management of volume of people? Either way, whether it's finance, people, health. Kathy, I believe, has worked out a way where we could do it. Um, I haven't gone over the specifics with her on on what, other than some general conversation that we've had. Um, when I talked to her earlier today, she seemed relatively, I think we figured out a way to do it, and I got to meet with you to talk about it. And I just didn't have time to meet with her today. Um, as much as I tried, I had a number of things related to this on the schedule. Um, the financial component i would have to find I, I would have to i would have to go and find some options some alternative funding within the budget to make it happen equal to the the dollar amount to open up the pool and run the pool i uh, i'm willing I spoke, to do i spoke with kathy over the weekend briefly and one of the issues that we haven't discussed with the pools is um, they have not hired any staff for the pools the longer we push off hiring primarily college kids, uh, they're probably going to find jobs elsewhere doing something else. And we decided to, no way. <laughs> I can rip, lip read. <laughs> yeah, I got, I got, you know, my high school daughter and her friends are all saying, oh my gosh, you know, if pools don't open, what the heck are we going to do for summer employment? Because all the lifeguards are, you know, scratching their heads going, oh my gosh, our, our summer gig is, is, you know, gone this year. So, um, what, as well as a lot of retail. Well, yeah. Um, so, w I mean, I don't want you to do an exercise in futility, but could you prepare something that shows us what the hundred thousand dollar cut somewhere else looks like, if that's an option? Can I just ask a question, Amy, would you be comfortable getting rid of the truck? for the pool or do you want both? 
the truck is not, is not in this scenario. But and I'm, just, I'm just asking. I mean, just, I'm just, you know, because I'm listening to this conversation and I realize I'm new to the game here in reference to what you're all talking about. But I believe the council is, is elected as stewards of the town's budget. And so we have a responsibility of being fiscally sound, but also socially responsible. And when I look at our mill rate, which is at 40.74, and I look at the surrounding towns like Rocky Hill, 32.4, Glastonbury, 36. And I sit there and say, Weathersfield's compared with New Haven and Bridgeport and Hartford. We're better than that. And we have a fiscal responsibility to keep the mill rate as low as possible while still providing the best services we can for our town. And so, you know, yes, I would love to see that pool open. But if someone said, you have to make a decision today and your job is to be fiscally responsible, then the decision today based on what we know right now is it's not going to be open. And other towns have already made that decision and they're leading in that way and more and more. I think West Hartford just said they're closing all their pools. So the idea is, is, is there, you know, it's easy to say, let's spend here and spend there and spend there. But I haven't heard anyone say, well, what if we take away from here so that we can do that? And, 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 and that's so, what I... So, that's what I just asked Gary to do. If he could, could, could Gary provide us with another area um, that he would, you know, I would like to see a comparison. Amy, well, could you, could you yours. and Matt, yeah, could you, Matt and Kevin provide? I mean, you're experienced on the budget as well from the last two years. Matt, you've been on both council and board and, and Matt and Kevin with the finance vice or finance chair last year. I am, I'll say it again, I mean, and I think Dan was going to this point, we're, we're, we want to look at guidance, we can look at guidance from Gary, or we can look at guidance from the council as a whole. Um, the end game is, is for us at least, and, and for the majority of people that I know I've spoken to, want it kept at a reasonable mill rate. And while I don't believe 40.74 is a reasonable mill rate, it's the mill rate that we have right now. It's not the 40.78 that it was before or the 40.2 before that or the 39.9 before that. It's 40.74. We've got to live with that. Our residents have to live with that. So if we can find a place where there is savings, I'll be happy to put that you know, 137,000 back. And, and if God willing, we can keep the pool open and find a way to, to keep kids safe and families safe, I'll do it. I'll listen to Kathy and, and find out what she recommends for, you know, timing and entry and days on and days off for families. I'll listen to that. Fantastic. Right I'll, I'll look. I'll look. Uh, I'll look. Um, I'll look through it again, and I'll shoot you an email in the morning with some of my suggestions. Yeah, I, please, and, and don't don't just send it to me. I'm just one of nine, so send it to the entire crew, uh, including Mike and and, and uh, Gary. I sure can. Can I just? Uh back in again, I don't want to have a four hour discussion on a pool, but, um, you know, I, one hour discussion on a truck. <laughs> I, I, uh, Hey, listen, I, I completely agree that we're not public health experts, but Charlie Brown is, I mean, he's an MPH and, and I, I trust what he says. So if we already have one member town or two member town shutting down and somebody with an MPH tells me a, a poli sci student who honestly doesn't know, how safe it is. If, if he gives us the advice of uh, it's unsafe, um, I personally, I feel completely comfortable going with, with his advice. And I think a lot of it is just the principle. I mean, like Kevin said, it, what does it come out to? 0.1 of a mill. It's, it's not the mill rate. It's, I think, more the principle that we're also showing, hey, we're, we're not just going to overtax, whether it's 0.1 mills or, or three mills. We're not going to overtax for something that we're not going to use this year. And we're making our greatest effort to be as fiscally responsible as possible. Um, you know, that's just my personal opinion. But, you know, if, if Charlie says it's unsafe, 
I, I don't know. I know we we're waiting on the legal guidance from the state, but am I, you know, personally willing to take that risk, even if the state says we could open up the pools, but Charlie says it's unsafe? I don't know if I'm personally, you know, willing to take that risk. And I, I know that's going to be a hesitation for a lot of people. And I know there's the argument, we'll, we'll let them make their own choice. But like we've discussed before, if there are liabilities and everything like that, you know, maybe we do have to step in. Thank you, Tyler. That was one line of number of questions or concerns on any of these others. Mike, uh, just a quick verification on the list that is in, I think it's paid, the last page of the scenario we were presented with. I just have a couple of curious questions about whether or not any of them are sort of more contractual related or the basis for the loss. So for example, um, I see eliminated 2% GWI for an HR and secretary. Are they not contractually obligated through a collective bargaining agreement to get something like that? Or I, I'm gonna, I'm just guessing that this is at the discretion now because of the loss or how is that figured? Those positions fall under the, uh, they're non-union, they're in the administrative group. Okay, so that makes, obviously, so this, they're not beholden to a collective bargaining agreement. Correct. Um, then I see eliminate one part-time assistant position that's currently vacant. Is that is that also like one and a half now that we're not, that's not a seasonal. Oh, I apologize for this. So that is a vacant, that is currently a vacant position. Yep, so that would be, that would, I apologize. So it is one and a half reduction. Okay. Um, physical services director, non-union, I'm guessing too. So that's why that's in there. Yep. Um, I saw a couple here and, at the bottom. And, and just for clarification on some of the, uh, I had mentioned there's some language changing in the description that should have taken place. Some of this was created prior to, um, prior to the memo or, that I sent yesterday that explained um, uh, a number of uh, inconsistencies in terms of, there was a question related to the, the chief of police's uh, salary and, and salary of the non-union people, which I had explained in the letter yesterday and I didn't correct it in here. So I apologize. Okay. I'll clean, I'll clean up that language. But again, the dollar amount is correct. It's just the description is not clear. I see uh, $68,000 under utilities school electric. Is there a basis for the reduction of $68,000 that we don't think that electricity will be used? So that, um, Matt, you may recall last year, the town took over the, the custodians, including utilities. Correct. And there was an issue at the high school where it was discovered that um, the our contracted rate was not uh, being reflected in the bill. Interesting. And so, and that was fixed. Um, but we weren't, we didn't have uh, enough information. Well, we knew we didn't have perfect information at the time because of that to hit the mark on the budget for the high school. Um, and so, in we just we looked at the april bill you know we took since we did the the uh pr proposed budget we've gotten one more bill you know and we kind of looked at that and tried to adjust for the shutdown you know and and what our projection is for this year and we just you know we feel comfortable that we can reduce the electrical you know that we put in for the high school by that amount okay and then the right above that, there's the trash disposal assume reduced rate. There's an old joke between lawyers about the use of the word assume, but um, why do we assume the reduced rate and what's the basis for assuming it? So when we originally did the calculation with Mira, so as we went back through the budget last night and today, we kind of picked up a lot of the, you know, looking for opportunities we checked the calculation when Mira first produced a rate. We didn't know when we were putting the budget together originally, we didn't have a confirmed rate. We knew it was going to be approximately $95 per, 
per ton. That rate has now been confirmed at a lower dollar amount through some phone calls and pressure. And so it dropped from 95 to 91, I'm doing my math correctly, which at 10,000 tons should be an estimated savings of 40,000. It's good. So it's really not assumed anymore. We, we have confirmation. Is that true? The assumption is based off of tonnage. So we're assuming that we're, our tonnage is consistent year to year. I thought you just mentioned that the, you just made a few phone calls and they reduced the rate. Uh, disposal times tonnage equals bill. I guess. I guess my. <laughs> I'm. I'm, ass, I'm assuming that right. I'm assuming the tonnage stays the same. But the, the rate, rate per ton is reduced. Correct. All right, and you have confirmation of that through a phone call. That the rate is reduced. All right. Um, the uh, I noticed that there's a limited one Chromebook lease payment. Just feels like a lease payment is a contractual payment. Any reason we can re eliminate one of our lease payment on our term? I Those believe. Were, um, go right ahead, Tom. Those were, uh, I believe, lease payments. Um, th they entered into a contract to lease the 2000 Chromebooks um, before they before next year, before the budget year. And they paid two, two lease payments in this year's budget so that they wouldn't be in next year's budget. Yeah. So there's and actually, savings there. Yeah, and actually to piggyback off of that, by doing the purchase this year, uh, because of COVID, there was a uh, rash on purchasing of uh, Chromebooks, uh, iPads, and any other mobile technology for students to learn at home. And because of that, uh, I believe Google had reduced the purchase price or the lease price for what the Board of Ed was proposed to lease for FY21. And by pre-purchasing, they actually got a lower lease charge and recouped some savings that way and made the initial two payments this fiscal year rather than um, paying the full amount next year. Got it. So one, Thanks. One, one place where they actually can realize some savings by, you know, purchasing or leasing early and getting a uh, better rate. Right. I think that was the total savings of about $30,000 off of the original lease price. Understood. Just as a general, general thought, you know, as we're going in these last couple of days and, you know, I know we kind of have a little I don't, heated debates, not the right word, but disagreement amongst the pool or a truck or something like that, all important. But I, I want to just pause for a second and say that there's, there's some really good work that's been done here by the counselors. I, you know, I see some fingerprints of Mike Rell and Tom Mezzarella, Mary, Dan, you're a little late to the game, but you, you know, obviously has a few great questions on the way through and have, you know the knowledge uh, base too. Um, I'm, I'm not sure of exactly where all the fingerprints are, but I mean, there really was some, there is some good thoughtfulness by Republican counselors, Democratic counselors, but I want to be fair with the um, praise is the right word, but thought thoughtfulness of some of these, uh, some of these uh, items and, um, and it should go noticed and I'm, I'm noticing it and I'm not going to play partisan politics here. We're going to disagree on a few things like the return on the bucket trucks, a no brainer. Um, and so on and so forth. But there, there are things here, items here that I completely agree with. And some of them are sort of like Republican pullouts of the budget and that's okay. That's absolutely okay. Um, I think I'm going to try to kick around a couple ideas. Uh, you know, it's obviously we're looking on 24 hours now since we just, since I just got this list, we, some of us just got this list. 
Um, I'm not sure if they'll all be within the budget constraints um, that you guys necessarily want, but if there's any give there, even if it's extremely small, a couple of you go, might be a couple other idea, good ideas from some of the other counselors as well. So I wanted to give you, uh, you know, some credit here because some of these are are accurate, and I and I agree with them. And I'm hopeful that maybe there's one or two that I can come up with that you might be agreeing with too. With too. So uh, Matt, Matt, just as a follow up, I want to, you know, give credit where it's due. Um, you know, in our own caucus, we we tried to go line by line, and we, you know, some people call it penny pinching, but we were trying not to, you know just slash things with a, you know, X percent, we try to get down, reduce the number. And we put together a pretty detailed list. And then we sat down with uh, Gary and Mike O'Neill and uh, they had to, you know, set us uh, new amateurs at this straight and say, you can't do this. You can't do that. Uh, contractual agreements or, you know, uh, we, we, we cut out, uh, some what we thought were excessive clothing costs and I said well you know it's six hundred dollars per employee it's in the contract you can't touch that it's okay and um, both Mike and Gary worked with us to come up with uh, other suggestions that might not be painful to uh, various departments and that's how we arrived at this list so it wasn't it wasn't something that we just pulled out of the sky and uh, so I appreciate your comments. Yes, and, and to your point, Matt, you know, we are seeing this list for the first time as well. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's been talked about and, you know, we're tr trying to find the numbers here and there, but you know, when you see it pen to paper, rather than on the back of a scratch pad, like we've been doing after discussions you know for the last two weeks with department heads and and amongst ourselves when you see it on paper like this yeah i mean a lot of thought went into these and it's it's not that it's you know a simple thing to do you know a lot of these affect all of us in town you know so um, uh, it, it was kind of difficult to do And I'll just add, since there's compliments going around, uh, first, I'm going to kick, and granted, nothing's been approved yet, but I, I, I can't take credit. Um, I got to give credit where credit is due. Mike O'Neill is, uh, is the one who has to deal with me, um, and I think my staff has been really great in trying to react to the requests of the council, so I appreciate the council's presence with me in terms of turning things out. Uh, I know it's been delayed um, longer than preferred, but it it's not a lack of disrespect or a lack of respect to the council. It's just time. So thank you to Mike O'Neill and, and my, uh, my entire team behind me um, helping me in terms of what the impacts will be and where they're willing to absorb along the way. But I know we're not there yet. So <laughs> we can give our, save our platitudes for tomorrow. But I, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention that uh, I'm more the conduit. They're the they're they're the uh, they're the brain trust. Yeah, I've always given Mike credit all my six years on the council. Uh, I think Mike, you vote. You were there for I think all six, maybe five out of the six, and obviously have done a, a great job. You know, giving us numbers and and being able to work with us. Um, both in the minority for the last six years for me and in the majority this year, um, you know, taking our considerations into mind. So. Thank you. Six for me too. Matt, creating a love session here. Nice job, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> I actually was just about to say, see what Matt started? Anyway. So, yep. yeah. so let's go back at it. Who, who wants to talk Jeeps and, uh, Legal fees, transit vans. Um, you know, I mean, you know uh, I'm not going to talk about a particular item except for overall. The thing that really scares me, and I don't know how to, and, and, and I think there's a conversation about a lapsing budget here, but the way we got here was certainly through some, you know, uh, 
line by line reduction here and there, $1,800 town council, right? Whatever it is. But let's be fair to say that the lion's share of this is coming from an adjustment in the in the rate of, uh, of the percentage that we have, which is a little bit subjective, but understand where you got it from because we moved the rate last year too, the collection rate. And then the other thing is to, that we're pulling out of the general fund, the fund balance. Fund balance. Which, yeah, fun, exactly. Sorry. I went state for a second there. Um, fund balance. And that's scared when we're sort of trying to move up, get to that, you know, level one, we're like, and it takes us years to do this. And so in like one 12 month period, we're going back really fast. And then I think of all the things that aren't being done this year, which are going to probably be turned on next year, right? All these pools, all the parking racks, all the rest of it, that is going to hit us like a ton of bricks. And there's no, yeah, you know, we're, we've, we're using the rainy day fund, like for this one, we're using it up. We're taking every piece that we possibly can, I, I think. And that's going to be, a, I, I don't know how we do it next year. And, you know, if we could like, and we could slope it in sort of business and we can provide a smoothing curve, but I see this all snapping back really hard. And, um, and I don't know if that's food for like real sort of strategic financial discussion but I'm, I'm scared for next year because I don't know how, how we're going to start refunding all of this stuff back to sort of relatively normal levels when we have an active society. And uh, it's a worry. Well, I, if I could make a comment on that. Um, so the way I understand, you know, we're, we're going to have a surplus this year. Um, we don't have an exact number, but I feel it's going to be fairly significant. And that money is going to roll into the general fund if we direct it to do that. So at the, at the end of next year, that 10.4% is going to increase. So it's not like we're, we're going to replenish. We just can't take the savings and throw it at the budget. It has to go through the general fund. Am I saying that correct, Mike, or? enough so in other words we're going to try and re we're going to replenish a portion of it not all of it but we're going to work to get to build it back up to where it was yeah and it, and we're not i don't know if you said swept uh, i forget what term you used matt but both Tom and myself, as well as, you know, Tyler, Pat, Dan, and, and Mary have always said, you know, we're, if we're going to dip into a fund balance, we're not going to wipe it clean. You know, we were pretty conservative with our, our thoughts and having listened to the, the talk last couple of days on, you know, S&P and, and, and the other bond agencies, um, and their thoughts on, you know, 15%, 7%, 8%, 10%, you know, we were comfortable with, you know, seven to 10, but I was no, nowhere comfortable less than 10% um, fund reserve. I've got the same fears. I mean, I, I think I've talked to every single one of you guys offline about what I think it's going to be like next year. Um, I've lived through those, those years of fully funding rainy day funds and depleting them within a year. I mean, the governor's gonna be doing it for this fiscal year um, to get us through. It is unfortunate, you know, we find ourselves, you know, when I took the oath, you know, nobody, all of us didn't think we would be here right now. Tom and I sat in on, and Kevin sat in on budget workshops for the Board of Ed back in December. And we didn't think we would be faced with these scenarios. Um, you know, it was my idea to, uh, to try and keep it steady as best we could at 3.74 mils. And in doing so, you know, we had to make some pretty difficult decisions. Um, and, and I think, you know, I, I know all nine of us personally that I think we're prepared to make those decisions again next year if, you know, if we need to. And uh, yeah, I'm, I 
I think I said something to Gary the other day. I, I plan on July 1st talking to him about what we can do for next year's budget. You know, I, I think he may even have started some conversations already um, with folks about next year. So, yeah, we're, we're faced with the two years of uh, uncertainty. At least with this year, we can uh, work hopefully together to, to, to make it right for the, uh, the residents and then next year as well. We, we also were very conscious of, of the Board of Ed budget and we were able to fund a 3% increase of their budget. So um, we are told no teacher cuts or uh, salary positions will be eliminated. So I think that was important. You know, there was people concerned that we were gonna, you know, try and take uh, huge sums of money out of the board's budget and, you know, the, Board of Education is important to all of us. So we, we worked hard to try and come up with a different solution than just uh, reducing their budgets. Yeah, and I think there was certainly a fear and um, I'm happy that it's not, you know, a 2.4 or some number, you know, like that. So I think there's a, there's a legitimate uh, discussion there that it's, you know, well under or under a million dollars. Um, now, of course, uh, and did you have conversations with, uh, it sounds like you talked to the superintendent or the board leadership that that wouldn't affect anybody? Yes. Which both, all? <laughs> yeah, all. Yeah, all. Okay, yeah. And, th and that's good to hear, obviously, because that's, uh, you know, that certainly was a huge concern of people. And yeah, sure, I mean, Mike, I'll say that. I was concerned Mike, about it. I got kids in the school. Mike and I sat down with, uh, Mike Emmett and uh, Matt Kozaka, and we told them where we were, you know, our our intention was to try and keep the taxes down. And we, we worked together to try and come up with uh, some relatively minor adjustments that he felt he could uh, tolerate without, you know, uh, cuts to services, classroom sizes, et cetera. Um, as a, just sort of as a closing thought, I know it's getting late, but as we sort of talk about the dynamic of what we face, whether it's the mill rate or, uh, you know, a greater request on services as we, as our demographics change and so on and so forth, Mike start to give consideration to Mike that we can work, you know, past, past budget or any leadership on the council or at the manager's office about coming up with a, a different concept, almost like an endowment model that the largest universities have that are frankly bigger than us um, in order to establish a fund or resources or capital in order to start to offset some of our long-term operating costs. It's a, it's a concept that is decades in the making. You can start it now, but it's decades in creation. But um, it's something that I've been tossing around just with a few people, we'd have to run the numbers, but it may change the dynamic over the long-term future of our town. That's something that we can have a conversation with after the budget's done. I think we need to come up with some creative ideas, you know, that being one of them. It, we just, uh, I don't see where we can continue along the path of not taking in enough revenue from property taxes and um, fixed costs that just continue to go up that we have no control of. Uh, waste removal and you know your normal salary increases and all those kind of things insurance so we have to come up with uh, you know I've, I've said it before I'm not sure if I said it in council meeting but you know there's two two problems you know getting through this budget and then what do we do for the future for five years out or ten years out or you know uh, the years when I'm not going to be around. So, you know, um, I hope we can all work on that. I'd be interested in working together. It would take a, it would take a cross party discussion, a serious cross party discussion or something like that. But Mar let me know. Marzarella Forest Endowment Fund. It's got to um, start somewhere, Dan. Dan, you, chip in, for, you chipped in for the lights. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
Okay. Well, everybody go back to their respective corners and look at this. Um, and I appreciate uh, Amy and, and Matt and Kevin's willingness to uh, come back to us with some ideas. You know, this is what it's for. Um, obviously, it doesn't say draft on it, but I think Gary can say that there are some terminology and wording that may need to be cleaned up a little bit. Um, obviously, you know, look through it and, uh, you know, we all have a copy of the budget and, and everything that we all looked at line by line. Think of some other ways to, uh, to be able to make some of your proposals work. I, I will speak for myself, but I think uh, everybody around this uh, Zoom table is uh, open to any and all suggestions. Anything else? If not, okay. Okay. Can I get a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. Dolores, it was Tom and then uh, Dan. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Ayes have it. Okay. Thank you guys. Thank you, Gary and Mike, for your hard work today. Um, you know, for those on the Board of Ed listening, uh, thank you. If you're watching, I don't know, live on TV or called in, thank you for your input as well. So, thank you, guys. Thank you.